Good morning, church. Um, the scripture is taken from Jonah 1, 7, and 8. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. As you can see on the screen today, the title of the sermon is uh, The Whale's Tale. And uh, yes, we are studying the story of Jonah. Um, I'm going to kneel just one more time and pray if you'll bow your heads with me. Lord God, um, we've learned so much in these stories of uh, the powerful stories in this series of Samson and David and Daniel. And Lord, as we study the story of Jonah, once again, I pray that uh, you enlighten our minds and help us to, to see your word in these common, familiar stories in a new light. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephen, you have a, the clicker. I think I might have issues here still. <clears throat> Where Luca has the clicker. Okay, somebody, whoever has the clicker, bring it forward. I'm going to start preaching. <clears throat> oh, ta-da. Thank you. <clears throat> the story of Jonah is one of those profound stories that, like, you have to be a believer to believe in. Because... If you're not a believer, who else is going to believe that some guy stayed in the belly of a fish for three days and then came out alive? I mean, it's just the most, it's the most amazing and, and crazy story. But um, the story starts off with God telling Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And you have to understand, like, the context of Nineveh. Nineveh. The Bible says that Nineveh was an exceeding great city. It took three days' journey to go from one end of the city to the other end of the city. It was massive, a sprawling metropolis. And, and furthermore, the Bible also goes on to say that it talks about how wicked the city was. It says in the book of Nahum about Nineveh, woe to that bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, and no end of prey. The Bible says that, uh, that the city was bloody, that it was wicked, and that it was massive. And in and, and the story, you know, it... It turned out totally differently, praise the, praise the Lord, but the story starts off like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> uh, basically, like, this is the most, it's a massive city, but also tremendously wicked, a story where God is basically going to come and destroy people who, who hate and reject him. But praise the Lord, the story ends differently. I want to look, look with you at the call of Jonah. The Bible says in, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now as Jonah hears this call from God, he begins to think, isn't this kind of a hopeless thing? I mean, this place is like Sodom and Gomorrah, desperately wicked, horribly evil, is there any chance that these people can really be converted? And, and, if, and if they do, will I not be a fool if they are converted? And, and Jonah looks at the place and he thinks, man, the place is hopeless. The place is dangerous. I don't want to go. There's a powerful quote um, from the book Prophets and Kings speaking on this very story about what was going through Jonah's mind. The prophet says, as the prophet thought of the difficulties and the seeming impossibilities of the commission, he was tempted to question the wisdom of the call. He's questioning God. From a human point of view, from whose point of view? The human point of view. It seemed as if nothing could be gained by proclaiming such a message in that proud city. He forgot for the moment that God, whom he served, was all wise and all what? Powerful. While he hesitated, still doubting, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. 
the prophet was seized with a great dread, and he rose up to flee to Tarshish. So he believed Satan's lies instead of the word of God. The word of God had come to him with a clear and clarion call. You go to Nineveh and pronounce what I say. But instead of listening to the words of God, he listened to his own mind and the mind of Satan. Oh, those people can't be saved. They're gone too far. He went to going to Joppa and finding there a ship ready to sail. He paid the fare thereof and went down in it to go with them. Notice the very next verse in the story of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Hmm. Then he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. But notice the last the last sentence, the last part of the sentence, away from the presence of the Lord. What is he doing? Does he like literally think that if he goes to a bottom of a boat, the presence of the God is not there? The, doesn't he know the word of God says, if I go to the bottom of the ocean, there you will find me for you're everywhere. Amen. You ain't going to a bottom of a boat to run from God. Jonah. And I'm looking at this uh, prophet. And I'm thinking, man, is this really a prophet? Can you really, the prophet of the Lord thinks he's going to get away from the presence of God on the bottom of a boat? Kind of interesting prophet, okay. You know, God had a special mission to change the hearts of the Ninevites. But his first task was to change the heart of his prophet. Amen. His own chosen <laughs> was not ready for the mission field. And so I wonder today that if there's anybody here today with me <laughs> saying, hey, I've, I've got a special mission for y'all. But first, I've got to change the heart of the missionaries. And so it is that today, I think we find ourselves in similar shoes to Jonah saying, yeah, I get the mission. Yeah, I know to the ends of the world. Yeah, I know the Great Commission. But i got other things going on or I'm afraid, or I'm scared to do it, or I don't feel like I have the right words, or I'm, I'm incapable. And so it is today, I think many missionaries are fleeing from their calling, even among our own ranks, even day to day, maybe one day committed, maybe the next day half-hearted. Continuing on in the story, though, verse 4 and 5 the Bible says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. Now, I'm contemplating the irony of this passage. Because here we see in the story that these pagans are praying. <laughs> They're praying their heart out. People who maybe could have even been from Nineveh. Who knows? <laughs> people who were not of the believers of God. People whom a prophet might have been sent to minister to. And yet, and yet, they're the ones who are praying their heart out, <laughs> seeking their gods. The innocent ones, really, in the midst of this circumstance, and yet they have no peace. <laughs> yet here it is, a man who is a prophet of God, sent of God, called of God, hiding out, guilty for running, and sleeping like a baby. And I wonder how often it is true today that the called of God half-heartedly receiving their mission, half-heartedly pursuing their calling, lulling themselves to sleep. Carnal security in this world. And yet we realize something very profound to me that it's Jonah's choices that endanger the whole ship. 
those people don't even know what's going on. They don't know Jonah's running from his God yet. And their lives are in danger. Is it fair? God has repeatedly told us that one person affects the whole. One person affects the whole. You remember the story of Achan? (laughs) That God could not send his people into battle because of one sinner in the camp that had oppressed God's leadership. In fact, in in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the story of church discipline where God is talking about dealing with one individual sinner in the camp. And the, the Bible says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And I'm, and I'm thinking now about Jonah, about he, how he was hurting everybody and didn't even think. The Bible goes on to say in that same chapter, purge the evil person from among you. That's specifically talking about church discipline and of a character that is quite evil. I'm not necessarily saying that we're supposed to go around finding everybody who's not fulfilling their mission and cast them out of the church. But certainly the Bible does talk about that there are certain expectations and conditions for people who claim to be part of the missionaries of God. You know, uh, I am on the Pathfinder staff, and what that really means is I get to have a short devotional. Katie prepares a lot of work. Jeffrey does the administration, and I get to come and play with the kids, which is good for me. Uh, And so I get to come and hang out with the kids. Uh, Raquel does uh, the drilling. Katie does the teaching. Jeffrey does the administration. And I get to just play. And and we we get all these uh, different games that Katie organizes and Jeffrey organizes. And they're fun. Um, But we we usually make them work in teams. And every so often, there's somebody who's dissatisfied with their teammates. Or maybe not so often, kind of frequently, there's somebody who's dissatisfied with their teammates. And the other day, for example, we made, people, we made them run through an uh, obstacle course, uh, three of them tied together by the feet. Um, and uh, you could tell the frustration on some of their faces because some of them could, quote, do it better than their teammates. And I even heard some grumblings of, well, I don't want to, let me switch teammates. I'm going to be on this person's team. And one of the, we took an opportunity to teach a lesson to say, you know what? Your teammates affect you. Your teammates affect you. That is real. You go, you go get a job in life. And let's say you're, 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 you're working with a guy who's a nephew of the boss and he's not holding his weight. Boss isn't going to fire him. You're going to do double work. That's just the way it is. That's life. But the same is true in the church. Your teammates affect you. The same is true in the family. The same is true in the church. The same is true in community. The same is true at work. Everywhere, our individual choices impact everybody else. And and the reality is, is that Jonah's choices were harming the people on that boat. They had to throw their stuff off. They never got that stuff back. And And I learned a couple of concepts from this. God is trying to, number one, wake Jonah up. (laughs) And number two, show his power to everyone. He succeeds immediately at number two, at least for everybody except for Jonah. But Jonah is still sleeping. Number one seems to fail because Jonah doesn't wake up at all. Everybody else wakes up immediately and says, what is going on here? And these mariners, these guys who have spent their life at sea, they know this is not some kind of normal storm. They know that the moment that they set out, it was blue skies, it was normal, they expected a good journey, and all of a sudden their life is at stake. They knew it wasn't normal. These guys have spent their life at sea, they've seen these storms day to day, and they said, this, this is something from God. And and even these people who don't know God say, God is speaking to us. And yet Jonah is asleep. I hope you get where I'm going with this. Brothers and sisters, there's, there's oftentimes one or maybe many of us who are asleep. In fact, you remember the parable of the ten virgins? How many virgins slept? Oh, we, you, got, you guys got it mixed up. You need to go back and read it. Some of you were right. Some of you were wrong. Five of the virgins brought extra oil. Five didn't. But how many slept? 
all the virgins slept. What does that tell you about the state of the church in the last days? That we're often like Jonah, sleeping away while the storm is brewing outside. Called to mission work, but distracted. Distracted by our own brokenness, distracted by our jobs, distracted by the cares of the world, distracted by whatever, but sleeping. The story continues. And so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? (laughs) Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. The captain finds the guy. (laughs) A pagan, a pagan captain goes to him and he says, what are you doing sleeping? We're about to die. The world is about ready to end, at least our world on this ship here, and you're sleeping? You get up, you pray. I find this so amazing that the pagan is the one calling Jonah to pray. And so it is today We were meant to be the head and not the tail, and yet so oftentimes, the world has taken our own message ahead of us. You see it everywhere. (laughs) The Adventist message being preached from non-Adventists. People teaching the health message. Adventists won't accept it. Oh, I'm not going to eat that way. But non-Adventists teaching the health message. (laughs) You see it preached everywhere. The idea is that Jesus Christ is coming soon and many of us are just counting our paychecks. While Jonah is out there running from God, those people who don't know anything about God are seeking him out, though they know him not. And there's people out these doors that are looking for Christ. that are begging for the message of the last days. Begging for it saying, please wake up and pray because I need what you have. God's name will be glorified. God's name will be held on high, and God's name and his power will be shown to the ends of the earth. Whether or not those whom he's chosen are sleeping or awake. The story continues in verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. The pagans know (laughs) that it's Jonah's fault, that this is happening, and it's not their fault. While Jonah's playing ignorant, they realize that God is speaking. It goes on. And they said to him, tell us, on whose account has this evil come upon us? And what is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And what people are you? And and he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that you have done? For the man knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Very interesting opportunity. A unique story. Pagans begging to know more about his God. Pagans with the mission field open wide saying, please teach me about your God. But a man who can hardly speak about his God because he's running from his God. Not fulfilling his commission. And I hear people say it all the time to me, and it actually bothers me a lot when people are like, I'm a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care how many generations you are. Jonah was a 24th generation Jew. He was called by God. He was a prophet. And he was running from God. The story continues. Then they said to him, what shall we do? that the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. The storm is getting worse and worse. The men are becoming terrified. They say, what can we do? They, they, they believe in the God of Jonah. When Jonah says, it's my God who's done this, they believe it immediately. They say, you're right. It is a God who's done this. The, the lot fell on you. This is your God's doing." 
they have immediately become converted. They are ready for the truth. And they say, what can we do? And yet, and yet their understanding of God is a bit broken because in, in their worship, when a God becomes angry, you have to do something to appease him. You have to offer him an offering of some kind. And this is the moment, this is the moment where, where Jonah can say, no, my God is different. My God, all you have to do is you ask forgiveness for what you've done wrong. You, you seek confession and repentance. God forgives you and you go about doing what he's called you to do. But no, he doesn't say that. Instead, he goes on to almost teach them wrongly about his God. He goes on. He says, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. What? Is that what God asks? Where? Hold on. God spoke once so far in this chapter. Go to Nineveh. Where did God say, in order to appease my wrath for not going to Nineveh, I need you to be thrown into the ocean? God never said those words. That's not, our, that's not even the God we know. That's not the God of scriptures. That's Jonah and his messed up head listening to pagans and teaching them wrongly about God. Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will be quiet. He goes on to say, it'll quiet down for, for I know that it is because of me that this great temp tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Uh, I was actually uh, writing my sermon on Friday afternoon, and there was a big storm yesterday. Were you guys listening to that storm? Did you guys, my house was shaking. <laughs> there was this amount of thunder, and it's funny because the girls, I don't know if they're really scared or they're half kidding. I don't know. Ellie's scared of thunder. Apparently, Sayla's not that scared, but Ellie's scared of thunder. And, and every once in a while, you know, there'll be a, a boom of thunder, and Ellie goes, oh, and I can hear it. I could hear her in the kitchen going, ah, oh, and I'm working on the sermon. And then all of a sudden, man, there was this huge, I, this huge, it had to have been super close to the house because I felt the whole house shake. And I was thinking, man, I'm reading about the, the, the sea growing more and more tempestuous, and, and it's like, I gotta stop reading this. It's getting more and more tempestuous right here in my house. <clears throat> but the thing that, that blows me away of this passage is the pagans are trying to save Jonah's life. Did you catch that? The pagans are trying to save Jonah's life. He says, throw me into the ocean. They say, no, let's row to sea. Let's not give him over to his God, quote unquote. They're trying to save his life. And it's like the, the roles are reversed. Wait a minute, who's the prophet? Who's the pagan? I'm confused here. And I see this day after day. I see this. People who come, it breaks my heart, brothers and sisters. People who come who love the Lord. And they say, wait a minute. Y'all are Seventh-day Adventists, right? Yeah, yeah, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Well, you all believe in keeping the Sabbath holy, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, why did I see your sister at the restaurant on Sabbath? I don't know. I don't know. And they're like, they know our doctrines better than we know them. They know. Don't, don't fool yourself. They know the truth. And it's like the opposite. Like the people who are pagans trying to save the prophet. They don't want to throw him into the ocean. So they're trying to save his life. There's a, uh, a famous famous man, I believe it was Spurgeon, who keyed the phrase, who, who had this phrase, are you a missionary or a mission field? And that was something he liked to say to everybody. He would go through everybody. He would have classes, and in his class, he would go to every one of his students. He would look at them in the eyes. He says, are you a missionary or a mission field? You can only be one or the other, and you have to be one of the two. You're either a missionary or you're a mission field. That's it. If you're not a missionary, you are a mission field. And if you're a mission field, you're not a missionary yet. And I'm, I'm sad to say it, but the prophet was a mission field. <laughs> People were trying to save that man's life. Continuing on in the story. Verse 14 now. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us the innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have done as it is 
O Lord, have done as it is pleased to you. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging and the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They said, Lord, I don't understand all this, but please forgive us for throwing this guy into the ocean. And here they are. They are praying prayers of confession and they're innocent. And the one man who's guilty did not utter any prayers of confession. It's these people who are praying for their own lives, praying for his life. Jonah is not yet converted. (laughs) The prophet, the one called of God, the one who is of the remnant, not yet converted. He should have been the one to stop them and say, no, no, all you have to do is confess your sins. God will forgive you. But they end up with a half-hearted gospel. Why? Because they're looking more at Jonah's instruction and life than at the true teachings of the word of God. And, and what really, <laughs> there's this saying, you, you sure know how to pick them. We usually say that to people who repeatedly, a guy or a girl who repeatedly picks a bad girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, that, that, that girl who's attracted to the bad boys and always ends up in a bad relationship with a mean guy. And we always say, we say to that girl, you sure know how to pick them. But I think, I look at God and I'm like, man, God, you sure know how to pick them. This is your prophet? Like, is this the best one you had available to you? And, but you look at, I mean, you look at the stories of, 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 of the ones that God has chosen, and they're all pretty messed up. Paul, the Christian killer, oh, he'll be a great leader for my Christian church, the one that's killing Christians. <laughs> Samson, the weakest strong man. David, the smallest and most insignificant. Jonah, the runaway missionary. Oh, those are my people. And I can't help him looking at our church and saying, those are my people. My broken, my half-hearted, my runaway missionaries, my insignificant ones, my, my people who are the weak, strong men, those are my people. They're going to be my people, at least. <laughs> God, you sure know how to pick them. And, and the thing that strikes me most of all is that I think God was not just saving Ninevites through the story. He was saving Jonah. Jonah needed this for his own salvation. Had, had he not been uniquely called to this purpose, I don't know if Jonah would have been saved. Which makes me think about my own life in ministry. <laughs> not very proud to mention it, but I, I often contemplate Lord, if it wasn't the fact that, like, I got to get up and do this because I'm paid to do it, I don't know where my heart would be some days. And I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that from the pulpit, but it's, it's true. It's real life. And I wonder if I'm not another Jonah who God called to the ministry because I needed it for my eternal life. And so it is true of probably most of the remnant church. We need this. We need this for us as much as for them. God sure knows how to pick them. I don't care if you're a fourth generation Adventist. That means nothing to me. I am, by the way, which is totally insignificant. God doesn't care how many years you've been in the church or what age you were where you were baptized or anything else. God cares about whether you're willing to fulfill the call. <laughs> Take your broken self to Nineveh and speak his message. You know, what blows my mind is that God used Jonah. <laughs> And he's going to use me. He's going to use you if we just let him. 
Yeah, we're imperfect. Yeah, we kind of screwed up along the way a little bit. I mean, Jonah left the ship with a pretty inaccurate picture of God in the minds of those mariners. And, and it, it takes a little bit of converting in his life, but by God's grace, he still uses Jonah. He still uses him to save the whole city of Nineveh. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. The story continues. Verse 17 now. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, people argue if, like, was it a whale, was it a fish, because, you know, a fish have gills, they don't have oxygen, he wouldn't have survived in the belly. Whatever, it's a miracle anyway. Like, why are you trying to rationalize that? No, you can, nobody can survive in the belly of a, a whale for three days either. It's just not, you cannot, I mean, the digestive juices of the stomach, like, you're gone. Or, like, there's no way. The whale swallows fish and they don't come out whole, like, it is a miracle. It doesn't matter what kind of animal it was, whether it's a dinosaur or whatever, that's a miracle right there. But this is where Jonah finally begins to repent. Where, where God is finally reaching his heart and he begins to pray. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. Finally, some prayer out of the mouth of Jonah, not just out of the mariners. It goes on. I want to share a little quote with you real quick. Oh, no, sorry. This is Jonah chapter 10, verse 3. I'll share a quote with you later. And the Lord spoke to the fish. He spoke to who? The fish. The fish. God has a language that you and I don't know, I guess. He spoke to the fish and he vomited Jonah out on the dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Same thing he told them the first time. And so Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. It took a little bit of work, working, didn't it? But he did. He went to Nineveh. Praise God. This time Jonah obeys, willingly gives the prophecy, albeit not the prophecy that you'd be anxious to share. It's not a prophecy that people are like, oh yeah, we're all going to get rich or like, you're going to win the lottery. No, 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 not that prophecy. Prophecy is 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's the prophecy. By the way, if you're a Seventh Adventist, you have a message for the world and the message is not a comfy one. The three angels' messages, judgment has come, Babylon has fallen, don't receive the mark of the beast. Pretty tough message. It's about like 40 days and this whole place is going under. Similar message, right? <clears throat> and that's what he says in verse, chapter 3, verse 4. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You see, the thing that is crazy though is that Jonah is almost okay with them being destroyed. He believes they're wicked. He believes they deserve it. And, and, he, and he, he's not upset about the idea of the message. He's upset about what happens next. <clears throat> but of course, by God's grace and amazing power, <laughs> Nineveh responds. <laughs> And it, I mean, no, nobody would have predicted this. I mean, you know, those, those statisticians, nobody would have predicted that this would have happened. It says, but the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God through the voice of a half-hearted prophet who went forcefully and who wanted them to die anyway. Are you following this? The people of Nineveh believed God. <laughs> they called for a fast and they put on sackcloth. And from the greatest of them to the least of them. These people are converted. In fact, it goes on. It goes on to say what happened there. It says, the word reached the king, the king of Nineveh. And he rose from his throne and he removed his robe and he covered himself with sackcloth and put on ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and of the nobles. Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Not even the animals can eat. Let them not be fed or drink water, but let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth, even the animals. And let them call out 
mightily to God and let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that he has, has in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. You know, in the book of Daniel, when God tells Daniel to bring this message to the king that an str- extreme judgment is about ready to come on him, Daniel says to the king, but it's possible to avert this great crisis if you're converted. Guess who doesn't say that in this story? Jonah. Guess who does say it? The king. What that tells you is like, the king understands more about God than Jonah does. He says, you can avert this. You can get out of it. (laughs) It's not an absolute prophecy. In fact, there is no absolute prophecies in the Bible. Every prophecy is conditional. Every single one. Except for maybe that Jesus Christ is coming. That one's for sure. But the timing and everything else is conditional. They, can, they are all conditional upon whether you seek God's will or not. And so the whole city repents mightily. I mean, it's, it's profound. It goes on. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. What an amazing conversion, and what a profound thing. And so oftentimes, you know, um, my very first pastorate was in uh, Nebraska, right at the very top north point of Nebraska, and we bordered with South Dakota. And right across the border, our town was nine miles from the border, and right across the border was a huge, massive Native American reservation. And um, we had issues with um, Natives, with alcoholism and and other issues. A lot of them, uh, certain places on the reservation were supposed to be dry places where they would not sell alcohol, so they would come across the the border and and purchase alcohol, and, and, and there would be little signs along the highway. Everywhere you looked, there was a little sign that said, think. And it took me a while before I finally asked somebody, why are there signs everywhere that says, think, with an exclamation mark? And they told me that every single spot is a place where a drunk driver died. And there was like 20 of them from my house to the reservation, like 15 miles, where the actual city is. And and so it was rampant. Alcoholism was rampant. It it was bad. It was not just alcoholism. It was drug abuse. It was, there was all kinds of messed up stuff. Rape. The highest, um, the highest teen pregnancy rate in the nation was there, and the highest teen suicide rate in the nation was there. People were absolutely hopeless. They hated life. It was a horrible place. And I said to the people, I said, we live next to the reservation. We are the closest church to the reservation. That's our mission field. There was so much prejudice from the church members who had lived there for decades with these people that they believed they couldn't change. And they said to me, I will work a ministry for the children only, not the adults. Because the adults are unregenerate impossible to minister to. I was brokenhearted over that. And I said, who is unregenerate? The people of Nineveh were converted. Come on. In fact, Jesus has this uh, statement about the people of Nineveh. It says, Jesus, comparing the people of Nineveh to the people of his time, he says, the men of Nineveh will, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So I thought, man, how dare anybody ever say those people will never repent. But we say that all the time. I I go to, I can't tell you how many churches I've gone to, and they tell me, oh, evangelism doesn't work here. I'm like, what do you mean evangelism doesn't work? Oh, people don't want it. They're not interested. They don't want to change. They don't want to change their life. And everywhere I go, oh, evangelism doesn't work. I'm like, oh, really? So... So you're worse than Nineveh. You think this place is worse than Nineveh? You think this is what, Sodom and Gomorrah? Why don't you just start praying for, for brimstone and, and, and sulfur and ashes to come down because that's, if that's what you believe about it. Let me tell you something. These people will turn to God if they're given half, an, half of a chance. 
if us broken missionaries will just give them half a chance to hear the word of God, they will turn to God. If we will pray like we actually care, we'll take time out of our busy day to just spend time with broken human beings, they will see the gospel and they will change. But here Jonah's having a little hissy fit because he finds out that God is not going to destroy them. And he's angry that the people repented. Now this blows my mind. It says in Jonah chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. That's the most blasphemous thing I've ever heard. Like, he's angry at God that he's, like, merciful? Like, man, what is the... God sure knows how to pick him. That's all I can say. He's angry at God. And what is he angry about? He, doesn't, he would have been happy if the people would have died. Get the, he, he was okay with those people dying. But he's angry that he looked like a false prophet. He cares more about his own ego than 120,000 lives. I hope this is hitting home a little bit. Because so oftentimes, we care more about my life functioning just the way I want it to, my time, I got to do things, I don't have any more time to do this, I can only do it this way. I don't have time to serve anymore. I don't have time to give Bible studies. I'm okay with them dying, in other words. Jonah is mad at God for saving human beings. Verse 4 goes on. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Are you serious? Even God is like, come on, Jonah. Are you serious? Can you really be angry? And and the answer doesn't come yet, but it it continues. Jonah, uh, chapter 4, verses 5 through 9. Sorry for the words being small on the screen. I thought that I had fixed that, but apparently it didn't synchronize the changes I'd made. It says, Jonah went out of the city and sat east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah answers, yes, I do well to be angry, angry even to the death. God says, wow, and then answers him, you have pity for a little plant, which you did not labor for, nor did you make it grow which came up in one night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left as much and also much cattle. He says to him, how can you feel no pity, no pity for those people out there dying? And yet, I'm afraid to say we're similar. Surrounded by people. And I I made this decision that when I first moved here from the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, to a more populated region here, that I was going to try to treat people like human beings. Because when I first, my very first district, you know, 15 years ago in the middle of nowhere, there's so few people that when you passed a car, you waved because there's, that you wouldn't see another one for a few minutes. 
And they literally waved at every car that passed. Because you may not see another car for 10, 15 minutes. And I come here, and I want to go jogging at Little Mulberry Park, right? And like, when I first got here, I decided I'm going to say hi to everybody. <laughs> now I go jogging, and since COVID is coming to an end, man, the park is packed. Like, it's like navigating through traffic to go jogging on the trails there. Like, I can't even, I'm like swerving in and out, and there's bikes, and I can't even, if I said hi to everybody, like, I couldn't even, like, catch my breath. And so, we live in this populated region, and we get to the point where people are not people anymore. People are obstacles in my way to my, to my accomplishment of my goal. And Jonah didn't care if they died. <laughs> and I think, I think we struggle with that as well. Seeing every human being as a soul for eternal life or eternal death. You know what's crazy? Is that the story ends right there. <laughs> There's not a next verse. We don't know what happens at the end of the story. Like, does, does Jonah change his heart? Does he get converted? Does he love them? Does he pray for them? Is he thankful that God saved them? The Bible just stops. And I think God left that cliffhanger there on purpose. He left it unwritten so you could finish the chapter. He left it right there that, so that I can say, God... <laughs> Am I going to care about these people? Like, you know, am I really going to treat human beings like, like I love them? I want to finish with a story. There was a teacher who had a class mostly full of bad kids. <laughs> it, was, it was the kids that no, none of the other teachers could handle. They all got moved to this guy's class because he said, I'll take them. It was, it was a lot of like sports people, you know, the jocks who were like really good at everything but hated school, were always no annoying, class clowns that caused trouble. And, and a lot of people that were, quote, popular at school but bad at academics, that was his class. <clears throat> and um, he had some tough guys. Um, one of his tough guys was named Mike. Mike was strong. But when he first got into the class at the beginning of the semester, the teacher had really made a connection with Mike. And Mike decided that he was going to put forth some effort in his academics. And Mike ended that semester with an A. The problem is, everybody else was failing. Everybody. So at the end of the semester, he comes into class with a boxes of donuts. Last day of the semester. <clears throat> but before he before he comes into the semester, before he comes into that last day of class, he catches Mike after class and he says, Mike, how strong are you? And he says, I don't know, I guess I'm pretty strong. He was stronger than the teacher, that's for sure. And he says, how many push-ups can you do, Mike? And he says, I don't know, I do 200 every night. And he says, can you do 300? And he says, I don't know, maybe. He says, could you do 300 if they were done in sets of 10? And he says, maybe. He says, okay, come to class tomorrow, ready. So he comes to class. Teacher starts putting a donut on the first desk. And he says, good morning, Susie. You flunked this semester. Would you like a donut? Susie says, sure, I'll take a donut. And he says to Mike, Mike, Susie would like a donut. Can you please do 10 push-ups for her so she can have a donut? So he does. He moves to the next one. Andrew, you flunked this semester. Would you like a donut? Sure, I'll take a donut. Okay. Mike, can you please do 10 push-ups for Andrew so Andrew can have a donut? Sure. Mike pushes out those 10 push-ups like nothing. But there's 30 students in the class. And so by the time he gets to the third, third row, the kids are beginning to see Mike struggle. And some of the kids are like, I didn't ask for a donut. And, and so finally, one of the kids gets enough courage to say no. He asks, whatever the name is, Bob. Bob, you want a donut? No, I don't want a donut. I don't want Mike 
to do push-ups for me. And he turns to Mike and he says, Mike, will you do push-ups for Bob to have a donut that he doesn't want? Yes. And he puts a, a donut on his desk. And Bob says, wait a minute, I didn't ask for the donut. I don't want the donut. And the teacher says, I don't care. This is my class. These are my desks. And these are my rules. Leave the donut on the desk if you don't want it. <clears throat> Continues down the rows, and, and pretty soon every kid is saying, no, I don't want the donut. And he's every single time, Mike, will you do push-ups for the kids who don't want the donuts? Yes. And he's beginning to agonize. Finally, he gets towards the end, and he's just pushing like he, a little puddle of perspiration is beginning to form underneath Mike's face at this point. <clears throat> he gets in the fourth row, and he's shaking now. He's not able to get up in between. He's, not, he's just resting there on the ground. And the kids, the kids are beginning to become upset. And they're yelling, stop making Mike do push-ups. And the teacher smiles. And he says, would you like a donut? Mike, can you do 10 more push-ups for the kid who yells and doesn't want a donut? Mike agonizes 10 more push-ups out. The kids in the hallway passing by, the bell is already rung, class is going late, and kids start poking their head in. And, and every time somebody comes in, they get a donut too. And finally, the kids start standing at the door and yelling at the kids, don't come in. But every single time somebody enters, and they don't know what's going on yet. Would you like a donut? Yeah, I'll take a donut. And there it is. Mike, can you do 10 more push-ups? Mike is now struggling to finish his 350th push-up. And the teacher said, guess what? You don't all only get donuts, you all get A's, because Mike just earned them for you. The profound love of God is waiting for a broken people, half of which do not want their donuts and which will throw it at you. I don't care. Let them throw it. Let them deny those donuts, but somebody paid for them already. Jesus Christ earned those donuts, and all that us broken Jonas need to do is just say, you want a donut? You want it? Yeah, we have a message that's a little bit, hey, God is coming, but it's also a message of love. It's a message of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, because it's a message, get ready, the end of the world is coming, but get ready, how? Because God loves you. He wants to save you. There's a way out from the destruction. You don't have to fall with Babylon. You don't have to receive the mark of the beast. By God's grace, he'll save you. So God is calling today for some broken Jonas <laughs> to go to Nineveh. What do you say? You want to go with me? Yeah. With that, let us sing our closing song. Please stand. <clears throat> We'll sing hymn number 50, Abide With Me.
To be honest, I'm just uh, one very broken Jonah calling out to some other broken Jonas. <laughs> I'm uh, half-hearted in my devotion in my prayer life often. Sometimes <laughs> witnessed to by others more than me witnessing to them. But I believe that if God will just give us, if we'll just give God that, that little open door to just put ourselves in a place where God's calling, he'll change. So yes. change that Amen. and use us broken Jonas for his kingdom. Yes. So I'm just making a call to us broken Jonas. Hey, well, let's go. <laughs> let's go to Nineveh. Let's get to work, brothers and sisters. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. Let us pray. Father, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for your grace. <laughs> Not just to the Ninevites, but to the Jonas. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace whenever I don't even reflect your character and my witness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for using people like me. Thank you for using people like us for your kingdom. Lord, as you open up that door of opportunity this week, I pray that you prick our hearts enough to say, this is your moment. Go share your truth. And may we be willing to call and answer, to answer your call instead of running, uh, running away to Tarshish. This I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If there's anybody uh, who wants to answer God's call and is not sure, I have some opportunities. Come talk with me. I might be able to find the right place for you in ministry. God bless. <clears throat>